A major development tonight in the tragic case of Madeleine McCann. Police say they have a significant suspect, a man in prison in Germany already for sexual offences against young girls. The man was seen driving this camper van in the area she and her family were staying in Praia de Luz. He also re-registered this car in a different name the day after she disappeared. The very sad news is that German police say they have good reason to think Madeleine is no longer alive and that this is a murder investigation. They are appealing for more information. Also on News at 10. Soldiers on the streets apparently against the Defense Secretary's advice as protests continue in Washington and across America. Anytime you see him come out here and sick his troops on those teenagers yesterday and gas them, and you see the people return right here without fear, then you know that a dictator's days are numbered in power. So is the test and trace system fit for purpose? Its chief has a torrid day facing MPs in the Commons. Uh, that, that just can't be right. That you, you're telling me you don't actually know how many tests come back within 24 hours and, and you're in charge of NHS test and trace. No, I have not had the data validated by the... So you've got data, but it's not been validated. The battle for Hong Kong as Boris Johnson offers some of its residents a pathway to citizenship here if they need it. And the long way home, the letter from a fallen soldier that took 80 years to arrive and the brother who was still there to receive it. This is On TV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Good evening. The police have never given up on the investigation into the tragic disappearance of Madeleine McCann back in 2007 while on holiday with her family in Portugal. But it is fair to say the trail had gone pretty cold. Until this evening, that is, when out of the blue, the Metropolitan Police announced that German detectives had identified a significant suspect who is already in prison in Germany for sex offences against young girls. They did not name him, but they say he was seen driving a camper van in the area shortly before she disappeared. He also owned a Jaguar, which he re-registered in a different name the day after she disappeared. Very sadly, the Germans say they believe Madeleine is dead and that this is a murder investigation, though they are appealing for more information. Madeleine's parents said in a statement, we will never give up hope of finding Madeleine alive, but whatever the outcome may be, we need to know as we need to find peace. Madeleine will be 17 by now. She is the little girl whose image is frozen in time. Madeleine McCann was three when she vanished. May marked her 17th birthday. The years have brought few answers to the endless questions as to what happened in this holiday apartment in Portugal. But now German police say they have a suspect in custody and they are questioning him about Madeleine's murder. The evidence we have gained so far leads us to believe she is dead the senior officer told German television tonight. After 13 years of investigations by British and Portuguese police, the man now in custody is said to have been living in Praia de Luz when Madeleine disappeared. Phone records place him close by an hour before she went missing, and it's now been revealed he has previous convictions for sexually assaulting young girls and breaking into holiday homes and hotels. We cannot exclude the possibility that after breaking in, the suspect switched his motive to sexual abuse, he says. Police have also released images of a camper van the suspect was living in at the time, as well as a Jaguar, which was registered to him, but re-registered to someone else the day after Madeleine disappeared. Police hope their appeal will embolden witnesses. This would be for anybody, you know, if they were, if they had some fears about him and they really wanted to come to the police and he was, he's now in prison, so this might be a great opportunity to come forward and tell us what happened. Since their first appeal for help, Kate and Jerry McCann have endured many apparent breakthroughs and setbacks. Tonight, in a statement, they said, all we have ever wanted is to find Madeline, uncover the truth and bring those responsible to justice. 
We will never give up hope of finding Madeline alive, but whatever the outcome may be, we need to know, as we need to find peace. Their little girl's face is known around the world, and yet her fate is utterly unknown. Perhaps this time the family will find the peace they have sought for so long. Emma Murphy, News at 10. Well, James is in Portugal tonight. James, how have the police there uh, reacted to tonight's developments? Yeah, well, a very straightforward uh, statement from police headquarters here in Lisbon, simply confirming everything that the uh, British and German police have said about this. This does seem to be uh, coming from Britain and Germany rather than from any new investigation here. Portuguese police, of course, have been criticised in the past, first for making the McCann parents official suspects, which they later dropped, uh, and then for uh, not uh, wanting to commit the open-ended uh, resources and money to this uh, single investigation that the British police have done uh, when they closed the case. They did reopen it again a few years later when there were some new lines of inquiry. When they came to nothing, uh, it's been put back on the back burner, though they have been uh, offering help to uh, the Metropolitan Police whenever they've needed it. They came here to Portugal five times last year alone. Uh, as to whether there's any new on-the-ground investigation, this does seem to be more in the nature of an appeal for information rather than looking for hard evidence after all these years. OK, James, thank you very much. Uh, and Emma joins me back here in the studio. Emma, of course, uh, you have covered this story right from the very, very terrible first moments. Look, why are the Metropolitan Police and the German police not naming this man tonight if he's already in prison? It's a very conscious decision and they were pressed extensively on it, as you can imagine, in the um, press briefing today. They say that as he's part of an ongoing investigation, they will not be naming him. They say that when they have suspects in other investigations, they choose not to so that they don't prejudice the situation and they're sticking with that on this. I think their feeling is that what they want is people to dig around in their minds, go all the way back to those early days. Do they remember that very distinctive camper van? Do they remember some of the addresses that have been mentioned in association with this guy? And also, um, they've given out telephone numbers. Does anybody know those numbers? Did they have them stored in their phones? Had they lived there a little bit longer? Um, was Pride de Luge maybe the place that they'd stayed for a long time? And somehow had contact with this man. So I think that's why they're not naming him. It is an abundance of caution at this stage. Is there any other information they're particularly looking for? You know, they've made a pretty general appeal for information, um, presumably to contacts of this man potentially going back over many years. Yes, they are very much appealing to anybody who may have known him back then, anybody who may have seen him back then. And I think what's striking is the message that's coming out from the police that this man is already in prison. He's being held on other offences. He's known to have a history of sexual offences against young children. And so that if people were afraid of him, if they were worried about speaking out over the previous years, they can do so now knowing he is in custody and they can speak with a degree of safety. They will be really hoping that that message resonates and brings more people forward with information that may be absolutely critical to taking this case to some form of conclusion. OK, thank you very much indeed, Emma. All right, whether it is the pressure from protesters or the natural course of justice, three more police officers are to be prosecuted over the death of George Floyd, which triggered protests across the United States. One has already been charged with murder. Three of his colleagues have now been charged with aiding and abetting murder. As for President Trump's handling of those protests, his own defence secretary doesn't agree with using troops. These are the implausible scenes we are witnessing on the streets of the American capital. Heavily armed troops spreading out to take up strategic positions across the city. At the iconic memorial to Abraham Lincoln, the very president who emancipated America's slaves, protesters gathered demanding racial equality. But they were confronted by rows of police and soldiers. This is a city that hasn't seen such disturbing images since the 1960s. What do we want? A mile away at the White House, the demonstration was the largest yet. The new security fence holding back the crowd, but only fueling the frustration. 
and the demands are increasing too. This is not just about police brutality anymore. It is about change. In Minneapolis, the three other officers who detained George Floyd will also be prosecuted for aiding and abetting murder. Officer George Chauvin already faces murder charges. This is what those officers took. That follows a demand from the mother of Floyd's daughter for justice. Their daughter, Shiana, is just six years old. Shiana does not have a father. If it's a problem she's having and she needs her dad, she does not have that anymore. And I'm here for George because I want justice for him. Back in Washington, the troops looked uneasy and out of place, refusing to identify their units or define their role. Are you with the regular military or are you uh, paramilitary or police? Protesters and soldiers are suddenly face to face on American street corners. We are not afraid. And here we have a bizarre little afraid. confrontation. There are military afraid. police here and then activists we're here saying that they're afraid. not afraid. But not there's a lack afraid. of accountability. We're Nobody knows afraid. who exactly uh, these soldiers or we're these police officers are. Facts. You are the terrorists. We are not afraid of you. None of us, none of us are afraid of you. I'm disgusted with you guys. Look at this country. Y'all see all these people rioting? It's repeating. Time is repeating itself. How many times do we have to come out here and do this? To the anger of the president, the defense secretary is tonight pushing back at Trump's deployment of active duty troops on the streets, saying it's an overreaction. Back at the White House overnight, the anger did not fade. Much of it is directed at the president describing these activists as anarchists and looters and at his decision to deploy those troops. Your days are numbered, Donald Trump. Anytime you see him come out here and sick his troops on those teenagers yesterday and gas them and you see the people return right here without fear, then you know that a dictator's days are numbered in power. Is this a crossroads for America? Yes, it is. This is a critical moment. These demonstrations are not dying down. They're not going to die down. The protesters are vowing to maintain their struggle for justice. And many see this as their defining moment. Robert Moore, News at 10, Washington. The outrage felt in America at George Floyd's death has spread around the world and certainly here to the UK. Anyone in any doubt about that need only see the size of the crowd that gathered peacefully in London's Hyde Park today. Among them, the Star Wars actor John Boyega, who made a passionate speech. Black lives matter! Black lives matter! Black lives matter! They began at the spot where for centuries voices have been given a platform. Speaker's Corner, Hyde Park and they came in their thousands. We are a physical representation of our support for George Floyd. Among them, the Star Wars actor, John Boyega. They want us to be disorganized, but not today, not today. For now, attempts at social distancing eclipsed by the urge to unite. It's just such a crazy paradox, the idea of being told to stay home, save lives, I think it would be a foolish thing to think I'm protecting my life by staying at home and not taking this chance to come out and speak out and be vocal. No justice! No justice! And so the crowds took over the streets so long deserted during this pandemic. At times, it was angry, tense, chaotic. But as they approached the Houses of Parliament, it remained peaceful. At moments, the police were clearly trying to show empathy. They might have been moved by events across the Atlantic, and yes, there is a desire to show support for campaigners in America, but they also want change right here in the UK. And as they gathered at the gates of Downing Street, hoping Boris Johnson was listening, there were some clashes. You can see a police officer pull out a baton as another tries to calm the crowd. Is this about showing solidarity with the US or is it about... No, it's about here? our own insecurities. 
institutional racism within the police, within the criminal justice system, within housing. This is institutional racism in England. This evening, things grew more unpleasant. Tensions rising between police and demonstrators in Westminster. This was always billed as a peaceful protest. Everyone hoping not to replicate the ugly scenes already witnessed in the United States. Rebecca Barry, News at 10. Well, let's move on to the coronavirus now. And much of our passage out of lockdown or otherwise depends on the test and trace system, which the Prime Minister has promised will be world beating. Key to its effectiveness is a fast turnaround with results uh, needed within 24 hours. The head of the test and trace programme was questioned by MPs about how many hit that deadline. She refused to say. The Prime Minister promised they all would, but not until the end of June, which suggests the world beating system he promised isn't world beating quite yet to control coronavirus testing and tracing must become a new way of life if you have symptoms you need to get a test immediately immediately because getting test results fast is essential for the new system to keep pace with coronavirus and when hannah winter developed symptoms it's exactly what she did sending off her covid home test kit with the first available courier they picked it up saturday morning and i never got a result um, I still, I've chased Sorry, twice. I've, you never got a result? Nope. I never heard anything. How long have you been waiting? Um, it will be two weeks this Saturday. And when her partner James got sick too, he had exactly the same um, problem. I also do not have any test results still. Um, and again, for me, it's now been seven days or so. Given Boris Johnson claimed it would be a world-beating test and trace system, it was a tricky Prime Minister's questions. Two weeks ago today at the dispatch box, the Prime Minister promised that we will have a test, track and trace operation that will be world beating. And yes, it will be in place by the 1st of June. But it isn't. Thousands of people are being tested, as, as he knows, every, every day. Every person uh, who tests positive in this country in the track and trace system uh, is contacted. Then thousands of their contacts are themselves uh, contacted. But the crucial bit is how fast that happens. Once a person tests positive, track and trace works by getting them to isolate and rapidly getting in touch with any of their contacts, asking them to self-isolate too and get tested if they have symptoms. But if contacts aren't traced within 48 hours, the system can break down as positive cases contacts have already passed on any possible infection. So how are they doing, MPs asked the test and trace chief. It wasn't a day for straight answers. No, you must know that. That, that just can't be right. That you do, you're telling me you don't actually know how many tests come back within 24 hours and, and you're in charge of NHS test and trace. No, I have not had the data validated by the... So you've got data but it's not been validated? I have not had the data validated by the authority who has expressed concern okay. over previous testing data not having been validated. The PM has now promised a 24-hour turnaround time for all tests by the end of the month. But provided any of us who get symptoms self-isolates and applies for a test, we'll be doing our bit to get the system working and denying the virus a chance to spread. Tom Clark, News at 10. One of the faces of those coronavirus briefings, the business secretary Alok Sharma, has himself had a test today. Mr Sharma appeared unwell inside the House of Commons whilst he was actually delivering a speech. And Paul is here to talk about this. Maybe better just start at the beginning with this and talk us through it. Yes, Tom. Well, tonight we are waiting to see if the virus that has already struck down the Prime Minister and the uh, Health Secretary has afflicted another member of the Cabinet. The Business Secretary, Alok Sharma, was actually speaking in the Commons today when he was taken ill. He was reading a second reading, in fact, of the Corporate Governance and Insolvency Bill when he started sweating profusely. We could also see he had to wipe his face several times during the speech. His department say after leaving the chamber feeling unwell, he was immediately tested for the coronavirus. He is now self-isolating at home. And of course, 
It was only this week that the uh, Commons returned for face-to-face -face debate and many MPs were reluctant to do so, reluctant because they felt there was a risk of catching the virus. It is understood that Alok Sharma is one of those who supported the return to Westminster. OK, Paul, thank you very much indeed. Now, the saga of whether we will or we won't be able to go abroad on holiday this summer has been running for weeks now with as much clarity as a grey British seaside day, which might well be all that is in store for us. We will have to quarantine when we come back, with very few exceptions and no air bridges for now, at least. Ignoring opposition from our own backbenchers and howls of outrage from airlines and travel companies, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, confirmed today the measures will indeed come into force next Monday. If we get this wrong, she said... We will all suffer. Something so many of us look forward to each summer, a fortnight's holiday abroad. But if it's immediately followed by a fortnight confined in your home, suddenly that sun and sand seem less appealing. Yet despite the UK having a worse coronavirus infection rate than almost all tourist destinations, the Home Secretary has confirmed the quarantine to protect, as she said, public Madam health Secretary here. These measures are backed by science and supported by the public and are essential to save lives. We know that they will present difficulties for the tourism industry, but that is why we have an unprecedented package of support, the most comprehensive in the world, for employees and for business. But we will all suffer in the long run if we get this wrong. So from Monday, anyone arriving in the UK must fill out a form in advance stating where they're staying. Spot checks will be carried out with fines of up to £1,000 in England. The other home nations are yet to announce their penalties. There are exemptions, though. Healthcare professionals providing essential care, road haulage and freight workers, and those working abroad at least once a week. And none of this will apply to anyone travelling from the Republic of Ireland, the Channel Islands or the Isle of Man. This is Alice and I at her engagement party, and now I won't be at her wedding. As well as the holiday, Lois will also miss a memorial service for her husband, 20 years on. I cannot afford to come to quarantine when I get to New Zealand for two weeks and quarantine when I get back to the UK, add four weeks onto my already five. I'm self-employed, it's just made it impossible. So I had to face reality and I've cancelled my trip. So the UK will remain effectively closed just as Europe begins to reopen. And without a single air bridge in place, an agreement between countries that would bypass the ban. We now know the rules around quarantine, but there is still no clear exit strategy from it. How does that make you feel as, as the boss of Britain's busiest airport? Well, I'm very disappointed that we haven't yet had an exit strategy. We've been talking about this quarantine for over a month and it still hasn't come in. Uh, it's not coming in until Monday. And unless we know what comes next, we can't plan our business. Airlines can't plan their businesses. And all those millions of, of jobs in companies that rely on aviation are all at risk. The government says it will review matters at the end of June. But for now, tourist spots such as Edinburgh will only be viewed by foreign visitors in a brochure. Richard Pallow, News at 10. And if you want to know what choice adjectives the Ryanair boss, Michael O'Leary, uses to describe the government's quarantine plan, though you can probably guess, he's one of the guests on Robert Peston's programme 20 minutes from now. Always worth a watch. Now, the vote by China's parliament last week to bring in new security laws in Hong Kong has caused consternation around the world, especially here. But Carrie Lam, Hong Kong's chief executive appointed by China to run the former British colony, has told other countries, yes, that's us, to stop meddling. She talked of double standards. It is within China's rights, she said, to protect its own national security, just as Britain and America do. Not a sensible comparison, but there you are. It came as our Prime Minister promised three million Hong Kong residents a path to British citizenship. Hong Kong's future, the very freedoms on which this society has built its success, are under attack. The Prime Minister today forced to promise a way out if China proceeds with a controversial national security law. In Beijing, to finalize details of the anti-sedition legislation, Carrie Lam denied it erodes Hong Kong's autonomy. The British Prime Minister has pledged to give up to three million Hong Kongers the right to live and work in the UK if this national security law is passed. What's your response to that and to the international condemnation that this law has drawn? Well, I can only say that the international community and some of the foreign governments 
have been adopting blatant double standards. You don't believe it breaches the 1997 handover agreement? Well, we are operating in accordance with the basic law. So when the one country uh, concept, the sovereignty issue, is now undermined by the events that we have seen in Hong Kong, this advocacy of independence and even uh, violence uh, verging on uh, terrorist activities, the central government has no alternative but to take action. The Apple Daily newspaper in Hong Kong has appealed to world leaders to save the city. Its founder and prominent pro-democracy supporter Jimmy Lai believes the UK has an obligation to intervene. They should help us because without the help, we can't survive this scourge of our freedom. He has been arrested twice this year and labelled a traitor and troublemaker by China. He believes Hong Kong is heading down a dangerous path. Well, the PIA said that, you know, according to the national security law, any time they will call in to cram us down, if they do so, a repeat of the June 4th massacre is possible in Hong Kong. That ominous warning comes ahead of tomorrow's Tiananmen Square anniversary. Vigils in the city have been banned for the first time in 30 years, at a time when it seems more important than ever to remember. Debbie Edward, News at 10, Beijing. Finally, 80 years ago this week, on the beaches of Dunkirk in northern France, the huge evacuation of British soldiers driven to the coast by the advancing German army was underway. Private Harry Cole from Suffolk, very sadly, never made it home. He was shot at Dunkirk by a German sniper. But a letter he wrote days before his death has just made it home after all this time and into the care of his younger brother. My dear mother, at last I can manage to write you a few lines after all the hustle and bustle of this life. They are the words of a young soldier to his devoted mother. But it was a letter she never got to read, a letter which took 80 years to get back home. I came from the school and mother sat, like, sat there crying her eyes out. Clemmy Cole was only seven when his big brother Harry was killed by a sniper. The oldest son, he was his mother, Rosa's favourite child. But he died three days after he wrote to her, and the letter went astray. She died in 1958, and only now has Harry's surviving family received it. My first thoughts are, my first thoughts were, uh, my mother. She'd have loved that letter. She really would, you know. She'd have probably give anything. She did receive letters from Harry, obviously, you know, but um, this, uh, this one, obviously, would have been so special. He seems really hopeful in that letter, doesn't he? Harry was convinced that the Germans were on the run. It, that he said that in the letter, didn't he? He said, I'll see you soon, you know. Well, Mother, please don't worry about me. I shall get through it OK. Despite Private Cole's apparent optimism, in May 1940, Allied troops were retreating to the beaches of Dunkirk, ready for mass evacuation. He died before he got there, and his letter and many others were lost in the turmoil, only to be found at the home of a German army officer in 1968. They were eventually returned to the Suffolk Regiment Association, and while most are still unclaimed, a researcher who lives in the same village as the Coles recognised his name from the war memorial. It's a bit like a film, really. We never imagined we might find living brothers. So that was, you know, really incredible to find that connection. But yes, we'd love any family members to be able to reunite them with their letters. It would be incredible. Well, mother, dad and boys, I guess I must close once again. Hope you all keep well. Roll on when this do is over. Harry Cole sadly did not make it back home, but at least his final letter has completed its journey. So until next time, cheerio. Love to all, Harry. Nina Nana, News at 10 in Suffolk. And that's all we have time for tonight, I'm afraid. Just a reminder that our main story tonight was that out-of-the-blue announcement by German and British police that they have a significant suspect in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. But that's all. Good night and thank you very much for watching.